um, showing up. If you have any, if you have questions along the way, I don't want to just talk straight for 20 minutes. So raise your hands or um, throw a, throw a question in the chat. But there's been a couple things that have intrigued me in the last uh, week or two, just from like personal reading and personal research, and um, I want to share. So what's interesting to me <clears throat> is how quickly all agents, so I'm not picking on anybody, tend to um, neglect the old leads and the old the old conversations, the old relationships that they've come in contact with in lieu of new relationships. And Tom Ferry is currently doing uh, his elite retreat as we speak. They're out in Vegas right now. He put this on the screen uh, and I had, one of my friends was just kind of broadcasting it. So it caught my eye, but of the the hundred or of the percentage of people who um, are working with leads that are not their their own sphere, right? Sphere is going to be considered completely different. The agents that are typically well rounded, working new clients, open house leads, expireds, um, internet leads, all of that, right? The proportion of them that quit after a short period of time, two to three months, uh, is pretty strong. And Tom did a Tom and Boomtown did a. Um, uh, like a research panel on this where they contacted a bunch of teams across the United States. What I found really interesting was how many of those are lying in that four to six month time frame. The four to six months after the inquiry is made is interesting to me. And, and I've, for the last like six months, I've been talking about the gold is lying in that three to six month time frame. I was mentioning that based on interest rates, right? I was I was basing that on if a lead came in in May or June, their whole world changed in terms of affordability, price point, interest rates, um, demand, <clears throat> that whole thing. Unlike really any other time that we've seen, to be totally honest, but we could go back years and years and years, right? The only other time that that kind of change in the market happened was in 08, 09, when we, of course, had the Great Recession. <clears throat> and this was nothing like that, of course, but there are so many people on the sidelines right now. And there's so many people, 70,000 people in our ponds as we speak that may or may not have transacted. The four to six month time frame is something that everybody should focus on, whether it's in your own follow-up boss, whether it's in your spreadsheet, whether it's your sphere, whether it's whatever it is, because that's the amount of time typically that it takes somebody to get through the human process of buying a house, right? I talk about this all the time too. Every personality is different, right? If it's Parker, I buy houses sight unseen. I look at the numbers. I don't care. Some other people need to feel it. They need to be emotional about it. They need to feel good about making that decision, regardless of financially how strong of a decision it is. Most buyers out there are taking four to six months to buy a house in general. When we look at seven to 12 months, so at 22%, I find that to be also very interesting because that's a long time right? That's like me and Liz saying, hey, we're going to buy a house this year. And then seven to 12 months go by and we don't do anything. That's crazy, right? Normally, if you're in the mode of like, hey, I'm going to buy something, I'm going to, I'm going to probably go and do it. 12 plus months is 10%. And what we're going to catch there when we study the funnel with real estate and how we acquire leads is that is primarily going to be the top of the funnel, Facebook and pay-per-click leads, right? Facebook and pay-per-click. And I'll say this again too. Facebook is interruption marketing. We're on Facebook. We're looking at uh, cats and dogs and wedding anniversaries and people buying commercial buildings and all of this stuff, right? And then all of a sudden you see this pretty carousel ad and you're like, oh, let me click on that. That's a cool house. That lead gets transferred into a database like PembertonHomesTeam.com as a website lead, right? That's a Facebook lead. It's interruption marketing. So that person clicked on something because they were just interrupted in their daily lives, although they are interested in housing, right? Those people are longer term. They're two, three, four. They can be five years out sometimes. Uh, Pay-per-click, which is also referred to as a Google lead or a Google AdWords, is somebody who spends money to buy placement on Google so that when somebody, Ashley, I'm looking at you. You're the only one with the camera on, on that little five frame sidebar here. Ashley uh, goes into Google and types in homes for sale in Victoria. 
homes for sale in Victoria is an intentional search. That's how a Google lead comes in. It's intentional. That person wanted to go and find a home, right? Let me just do this really quick for you guys. Don't judge me for my computer background. It's by far the most unorganized part of my life. Uh, okay, homes for sale, Victoria. What we're gonna find is we're gonna find Open Door. We're gonna find Minneapolis Home Viewer. We're gonna find whoever this is, David Asbill, friend of ours, good dude. Realtor.com, Zillow, okay? So you see ad. These are the people that are spending money to promote that search bar, okay? It can be a lot of money. It can be a little money. Then you've got the big dogs, Realtor.com, Zillow. That's based on search criteria. Donna Realty, Movado, which I can't believe. I've never seen anybody pull a lead from Movado before. Just a sidebar there. When you understand how this lead is coming in, your strategy can change in your approach, right? Most people, by the way, most smart people don't click on ads they scroll down to a reputable company that they understand and they like, such as Realtor.com or Zillow. That's just what the majority of people do. But you will get people that come in here and they just click this. <clears throat> and that's Kirby and Christina. So good on them, right? They pump a ton of money into pay-per-click ads and they don't do a whole lot with portals. They've been doing it for a long time. So Kirby and Christina, unbranded, by the way, so the consumer does not know that that's who that is, just picked up a click. If we're, if we're going to come in here and click on this house, boom, I can't even look at a picture without logging into their website, right? So that's a good point too. If you are forced to log in to look at photos, that lead is coming through the database. That might be getting assigned to you guys. Like, Think about the mentality of that. If you're forced to do that, just do that. You're probably going to say, hey, Ashley, no, I'm not interested. You call back two weeks later. Why are you still calling me? I'm not interested. No, I'm not interested. Unsubscribe, unsubscribe, leave me alone. F you, whatever it's going to be, right? Eventually enough of it is going to cause them to reject and move back, even though they originally went into Google at some point and wrote Homes for Sale Victoria. Does that make sense? Does the, the way of a lead comes into our system and into your life makes sense when it, in, in terms of interruption versus intentional? <clears throat> yes. Right? Okay, so the next part, the third part of the funnel is the bottom of the funnel. It's the portal leads, it's Zillow, it's Realtor. It's the ones where somebody is going in there and clicking a button to say, I want to see this house. Those are the strongest leads. That's why all of these billion dollar companies have figured out how to tack on a 35% referral fee because they're getting them before we are. But to understand where that person comes from, they had to click a button to say, I wanted to see this house. It's a lot different than saying, I'm looking at puppies and kitties and, oh, wait, that's a cool house. I'm going to click on that photo. So the, the opportunity that we have, the reason why we invest in so many different sources is because we want to fill that funnel from the top and we want to be able to catch some of those Ylopo or pay-per-click Google leads at the top that we can pay 10 to $20 for rather than at the bottom that we have to pay 35% for, right? The mentality around this conversion piece though is so important and it's something that I constantly focus on. Whenever there's consumer spending, whenever I decide to do something, <laughs> right? I always have to think to myself, how do I want to be sold? How do I want this salesperson to treat me? And that's the approach that we should all take too. When we're reaching out, when we're prospecting, when we're working our databases, how does this person want to be treated? How does this person want to be communicated with? Because if you can figure that out quickly, it's an expert salesperson technique. If you can figure out how that person wants to be sold, they will stay in your life longer. If they stay in your life longer, now they're watching your social media. Now they're Googling your name. You know, who's Rachel Langjohn? Like, sorry, I'm just looking at you, Rachel. Like, she's been so great. She's communicating me through, you know, through Zillow. I've been talking to her, blah, blah, blah. Who is this random person that's going to meet me at the house, right? Then they catch your social media and now Langjohn. It's, it's what? Langshen. Oh, please. Yeah. We throw some J's in there and some G's, but it's Langshen. Yeah. Okay. You're, you're, made, <laughs> you're, uh, you're, what is it considered? You're not your maiden name. Is it? 
No. Miller's Mary Lord. name? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. whatever. I don't even know. Um, yeah, <laughs> your, Miller, first la- your first last name when I met you was a lot easier, by the way. It was easier. Yeah. People yeah. still call me that. I still <laughs> say it because it's easier. For sure. Um, the, but, th- thanks for letting me use you as an example, Rachel. But that's what's happening these days, guys. Like, we're people are Googling you before they even meet you, which is why it's so important to keep our profiles updated and and be and be the voice of of um, education with real estate, right? They're gonna no matter how old you are, no matter how experienced you are, no matter no matter how many homes you sold, they're gonna go to the internet. It's just what people do, and they're they're gonna they're gonna look you up. So that has to be solid too. But my point is, we're losing a lot of this gold that we have in the long term follow up just based on our first reach out saying, you know, hey, hey, Luke, it's Parker from Pemberton Homes. Are you still looking to buy a home? Like, I'm sorry, but that doesn't work anymore, right? It really doesn't. They're going to say, no, I'm not interested. Unsubscribe. When you can go on your cell phone and somebody texts you, um, this hopefully isn't going to be too embarrassing, some sunglass company. Hey, Parker, because I ordered sunglasses. Hey, Parker, just want to let you know, we've got a new version of the blah, 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 blahs. When I click it, because it's an unknown number, I can unsubscribe. I can report junk, right? That's, I mean, that's 2022. That's 2023, right? That didn't happen in 1980. Like in 1980, you'd have to call somebody on their house phone and they'd pick it up every single time. That was the only way to communicate. So my point is we need to be mentally more prepared for that longer term follow up so that we can stay in everybody's life longer. The best way to do that is what I posted on the Facebook page a couple of days ago. And if you guys remember one thing from this, it's dangle the carrot. Dangle the carrot and what is the carrot? The carrot is that off market property. The carrot is that house that was just listed 2 minutes ago. That carrot is uh that the Fed just uh, just lowered rates by half a point. The things that the public, when they're working at corporate Target downtown, they're not getting that information, right? If if somebody, if I'm looking to buy something and somebody reaches out and says, Parker, hey, this house is priced 10% below value. I think you need to come see the house. I'd be like, well, shit, I should go see the house, right? Rather than, hey, Parker, are you still looking to buy or sell in 2023? drop that approach entirely, right? And the Facebook post that I posted, by the way, I'll pull this up again. Not logging in. And by, hey, by the way, if you want to test this, go log into Kirby's system, figure out what happens. You're going to get connected to an ISA in Oklahoma City. Angela Kim Kim could probably tell you a little bit more about what happens there, but they're going to reach out to you. They're going to pest you. They're going to put you on long-term drips and you're going to find out what it's like to be on the other side of what I'm talking about. Let me show you. The gold bar, right? The gold bar is the carrot in real estate. It's that dangling of, hey, I've got this thing that you don't have that you want. And in terms of real estate, some things that we could be reaching out. And by the way, this is in the Facebook group. So you could literally copy paste this, save it to your desktop and use these when you're prospecting and working people. Uh, Hey, Josh, I just found a great home that fits your criteria. They lowered the price by 10% yesterday. I think we should go see it. What's your availability? 10%, man. Like when was that available in the last five years? It wasn't. We're we're in a market condition right now that is so opportunistic. Um, I mean, I'll share this. Most of you know, like I just bought an investment property in Florida and I bought it. I got 15% off the sales price. I won't tell you what the sales price was or what the amount was. 15%, right? Unbelievable. That hasn't existed forever. Give me six months. If you want to go to Florida, text me, by the way. Just wanted to share rates. All right, five and a half percent. We haven't seen that since May, Rachel. What do you think about that? Last month, I convinced three sellers to cover my buyer's closings. Hey, Josh, how about your testimonials you've been posting, which I love? Share that with your audience. Hey, you won't believe what we were able to do on the last. Hey, guys, you won't believe what I was able to do for Josh and his girlfriend, Bethany. No, you're single. I'm sorry. 
We were able to negotiate the price of this home in Victoria down 15% last month. These opportunities are crazy. Are you interested in talking more? I just hung up with your lender. She shared, <laughs> this is just interesting. With a rate buy down, we can get you about five and a half percent fixed today, right? And the news is saying six and a half and seven percent. You won't believe the deal that DR Horton just gave one of my buyers. They gave us a free basement, paid all the closing costs, gave me 3%, which is great. Don't mention that. And they gave them $8,000 towards upgrades, right? We've got gold bars and, and carrots here that we're hanging in front of people. The other thing, I just, a personal strategy that I love, I set everybody up on an MLS search. And whether they they are in the search or not, I'm putting myself in there. I've got a little thing that just says PP and I'll put somebody in and set them up in a search so that I get that notification before they do. And it works great with prospects. It works great with people that you're actively working with because guess what's happening in their inbox? They're getting the same email and boom, Josh texts him 15 seconds later. We got to go see this house. This just popped up. This is going to be a hot house, right? At no point am I saying, do you want to buy or sell a house? Hey, are you still in the market to buy or sell a house? Hey, are you still interested in buying? Because they're just not going to respond, you guys. And, and we have to drop that from our entire approach. We have to bring value. We have to bring things that they don't have. We have real estate licenses and MLS access for a reason. We can find some super cool stuff. Uh, we can go back two years and find all the homes that didn't sell. And we can call all, the, all of those people and see if, hey, by the way, Josh, I know you didn't sell your house two years ago, but if I had a buyer that was willing to pay, pay full price today, would you be willing to show the house? Right? That's not a, hey, I saw your house expired. I work for Pemberton Homes. We're number one in the state of Minnesota. We do all this marketing and we retarget and this and that. Can I come and list your house? Right? It, that doesn't work. It just doesn't work anymore. So giving them something to take and to believe in, uh, it works. And then guess what? The more you do this, the more that they're going to be like, you know what? We need to call Josh. We need to call Rachel. We need to call this person because they bring, they're bring they bringing so much value to our search and to what we're doing that he's just our guy, right? And the next one too is disarm them. Disarm somebody that you're talking to by saying, you know, understanding at a true level, this is a Facebook lead, this is a Google lead, right? Hey, I got to switch up who I'm looking at, sorry. Otherwise I'm going to pick on the same people. Sharon, <laughs> Sharon, I saw you were looking for some homes on our site. Hey, I'm not trying to sell you anything. And I'm sure you're not in the market to even buy a house, but I wanted to make sure that we're at least sending you the proper information of what you're looking for. Is there, is there an area of, of the town that you're looking in specifically, right? Is that a little bit different than saying, um, Hey, Sharon, you're on my site. I saw you looked at 58 homes. I'm stalking you. Are you looking to buy a house this year? <laughs> right? Like, hey, I'm, you know, Sharon, I just wanted to reach out really quick. I know you're, I know you're probably not in the market to buy a house, but I did see your name come across my, my desk. And um, I just wanted to be prepared that when that time comes that I'm sending you the right information. Is that okay? Well, sure, Sharon. Yeah, of course. Because guess what? In their brain, you're not trying to sell them something. It's like Sarah Church at open houses. I'm looking at Sarah now. Like when they walk in, you're not asking them, do you want to make an offer? No, they just met you. They just walked in the house. Of course, they're going to see houses. They're out in the market to see houses. Of course, they're going to do something. But how can we earn that trust? How can we get in, inside of that conversation and start to add some value? So think about the carrot. Think about the gold bar. Think about what are those things, what are those things that you're doing um, to engage those people into conversation so that you can actually ask them the real questions. And... Uh, one more thing, like LP Mama, a lot of us were trained on this. And unless you got into real estate in like the last year and a half, two years, LP Mama was, um, it was literally the script. I mean, we'd hang this on the walls in the real estate office and I would read off of this script. And it was LP Mama is location, price, motivation. Do you have an agent and money, right? Are you pre-approved, Josh? Well, I don't know. I don't even know who you are. I don't even know what you look like. Why are you Why are you asking me if I'm pre-approved? Or the opposite, like I own 30 homes, dude. I don't need to be pre-approved. I'm paying cash. And if you're asking me about a lender, <laughs> you know, like screw off, right? We, we can't get into those details until we've earned the trust of 
the client. That's my whole point. And by bringing value, we are different than the other nine realtors that they see casually on their Facebook uh, pages, right? Or Instagram pages. Does that make sense? I'll go back to this. There is so much gold. I know it's easy to focus on the next phone call. But a lot of times when we're focusing on the next phone call, we are forgetting about the person that is actively searching for homes because guess what? This 8% and this 27% can easily put on the brakes and turn into this four to uh, four to 12 month buyer. And, and when we're only focusing on what's coming in, we're not focusing on providing value to the other people. I would really challenge you there. I would really challenge you there. I still have, and Liz can can verify this. I still have people from 2016, 2017 that email us. I was out with them at one point. They stalled and they came back to our company because we consistently were there providing value to them where they just pop in. Uh, if Jen's on this call, sorry, Jen. That, I know that was a bad one. It was Mary. Uh, yeah, bring it up. Way to rub it in. Like just, just I just wanted to make sure you guys knew I wasn't. <laughs> I just wow. wanted you to know I wasn't lying to you. But to 2016, $300,000 cash buyer um, comes in and they and remember. And transparency, I dropped the ball. I mean, I did, but I didn't. I mean, I could have, should have, could have done more. But I was frustrated because she, I felt like she was, for lack of a better word, she was dicking me around, which I, I truly think she was. But she also stalked the neighborhood and she won. And she has that. I mean, Jen, Jen, it happens. We're in sales, right? We're I in, know she won. I'm so mad. You uh, know, in, in baseball, what's funny is, is if you hit, for those of you that know baseball or don't know baseball, if you hit, um, 335 a year, which is your batting average. That means you would actually hit, you would be on base three out of 10 times. If you do that for your whole career, you're considered to be in a hall of famer. That's nuts. Three, you, you, you succeeded three times. You failed seven. The plus and is the other one that came back to you too. Like we've really formed a very good relationship. And I've found that, that, that generation, right? Like that 45, I feel like 45 to 65 you really do have to nurture them and, and really establish a trust with them. And most of them stick except her. That's where sales EQ comes in. How good of a salesperson are you? A lot of times it's not what you say. It's how you understand the person. It's mm -hmm. constantly thinking about what do they need? How do they want to be sold? What is this personality type? How can I transform my approach to be better to better connect with them. It's th yeah, that's and that's what I is. learned. I I I got a bad attitude because I was frustrated with her because I felt like I was doing a lot of work. And I, I mean I learned and grew from that. I I could have I could have gone out one more day. You know, I did go out, but I didn't do enough and I lost it. You know, so now it's it's helping now because shit, I lost what eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars out of that. Woo. Yep. Ouch. So I would look, I would look internally about what you did. I'd learn from it. I wouldn't make the same mistake twice, right? No. Mistakes are completely okay to make as long as you learn from them. If you don't learn from them and you keep doing it, you're just an idiot. That's all there now, is. Now, when to you it. have somebody like that, because you know, like, so guys, she was not, I felt like I was doing a lot of work and I was trying to get her under buyer rep. And and she was just adamant about not going under by a rep and and mentioned multiple times that she was working with multiple agents like seeing and talking to multiple agents in this area so at that point I just it wasn't that I wasn't putting work into it I was doing it like on a weekly basis but not enough she ended up stalking the neighborhood and finding a random person outside I, that may have happened no matter what I just what do you do in that case of those people like that, where you, you really like, she was adamant that she would just was not committing to me. You keep like, that was my struggle with her was knowing how much effort I put into for somebody who really, I didn't know what to do. 
you know. You're focusing on one person when you can focus on 99 others. I mean, that's the reality. Agreed. Of it, yeah. Right? So just well, don't make the same mistake. Up. Don't make I the same curious. mistake twice. But Jen, let, let we can address that near the end. Let me continue. Yeah. At at in the in the the baseball world, 33 percent, you're considered an all star. You're in the Hall of Fame, right? You make millions, if not billions, of dollars. Alex Rodriguez hit 320 his career. He could also hit home runs and steal bases, but he was a 320 hitter, right? In real estate, if you're a 10 percent hitter. If you close one in 10, you're an all-star. We have to understand that. So don't focus on the ones that you miss, Jen. Get better, obviously, and learn from that. But focus on the ones that are still in that pipeline that you can turn into that 10%. And by the way, the expert converters can close up to 20%, 30%. Uh, it is possible. But 10% is extremely good in real estate. So if that's the case, you guys, and we have 100, 100 buyers walk in our door, right? And each month you have a 10% closing rate. Think about how many of those people are not buying homes in that month. They're buying homes six months, seven months, eight months later that can easily turn into those people. They can easily turn into that, hey, Josh, you know, you showed us a house six months ago. You were great. Now we're ready to go. Well, cool. Guess what? They're going to buy a house probably within five showings. And if you would have dropped the ball and you didn't provide the value, they're probably either going back to Zillow, they're going to an open house, or they're asking their best friend who they worked with the last time they bought or sold the house. And it happens all the time. So I really want to encourage everybody. I mean, like this will literally put more money in your pocket for your entire real estate career if we focus on some of those longer term opportunities rather than just the ones right now. And the reason I believe in always filling the funnel from all directions from all sources, we call it, we used to call them spokes on the wheel. I'd want at least 12 of them is because everyone's time frame is different, right? And in times like this, if you're sphere-based only, when interest rates go up 4%, you are literally waiting on your next client to call you, right? That's not, that's not business. A business, your business is you actively reaching out, actively working with people, it's not waiting. It's not reactive. We have to be proactive in real estate, not reactive, right? Um, in times when it's good, when we had 3% rates, everybody was coming out of the woodwork because that 1980s buyer knows what 3% means. And that millennial or whatever the next version is, Gen, Gen Z, their parents are telling them what 3% is. Everyone was coming out of the woodwork. That's why in America, we sold 6 million houses. But I'll tell you this, there's still going to be 5 million houses sold this year. So don't let that deter you. What I would really focus on is that gold bar or that carrot. Um, if I were you, I would, I would come up with a document, a, like a Google Doc, share it with the team, share it with your friends, all of the different creative ways to, to share that gold bar, to share those carrots. And what are you saying? What's working for you? What did you say to re-engage this person? And, and the more of these that we have, the more you can just rip off and duplicate, right? Um, let me go over to Amy. We, you've got a flag in here. Is that Norway? Yes, sir, it is. <laughs> you want to explain that? Oh, because Rachel's last name is Norwegian. Uh, so I was showing my- about that was my support for Norway. <laughs> yep. Jen, Jen brings up a good point. Um, I, you know, if you're actively working with somebody, I would, I would do the two part close, which is, are you available at four? Or are you available at six? You know, the, the brutal honesty is if you're not on appointments all day, um, you know, you're, you're not that stretched. Like I would say, Hey Dylan, you know, this home just hit the market. It's 10% below the comps. This is an incredible home. I think we should go see it and what we and see what we think. When are you available to go see it? Well, okay, I'm available at seven tonight. Well, I'd get over there and I'd show them the house, right? Um, Amy, you don't spend time with people that are openly shopping with you. What does that mean? No, I was just kind of like commenting to what Jennifer was lamenting about that prior, you know, potential client. When someone's like very clearly 
um, kind of getting the jerk around feeling. I just don't spend time with it because there's other people out there that want to buy houses. And I, I learned a lesson last year where I just spent like the first four months spinning my wheels with people that either couldn't transact financially or were just too tough of a client to get under contract or people that just wanted to shop around. So what I would do with those people. And, and by the way, Amy is uh would be in the hall of fame of real estate conversion because she's at 10%. So I want to <laughs> make, you. make that note. <laughs> um, and Amy, when I think about you and your skill set, it's, it's sales EQ. It's understanding the people. It's understanding where they're at in their life. You bring life experience and life and, and working corporate experience into real estate, which helps you be more well-rounded with people. But this is also something that everyone on this call can learn in the next six months too. Um, what I would be doing, and maybe that's an understatement. You'd have to be like, really be into it to learn it in six months. But anyway, if they're, if they're non-committal, you guys put them on the back burner and put them on a one to two week plan where you reach out to them. Hey, you guys, I understand you're not looking to do anything for the next year, but this house just hit the market. And I want you to understand what kind of home you can get for the price point, right? Three months later, hey, here's a market update, Luke, in Victoria uh, for the last six months. I know you're not looking to buy anything right now, right? We're, we're disarming them, but I wanted to keep you updated on what's going on in the real estate market. Have a great day, right? And then the next one. Hey, you know what? I just talked to the seller who's down the street in Excelsior who told me they would sell for the right price. I know you're not necessarily looking right now, but for an off-market deal where you don't have to compete, would you be interested in seeing this house? Well, guess what? If they say yes, they're going to meet you in person and take time out of their life and they're going to get an interaction with you. You're going to get to impress upon them. And next time that they're ready, they're going to call you. That's the way it works. And you know why? Because it's really freaking inconvenient to meet somebody brand new and form that rapport again. Like, If anyone's bought multiple houses with multiple lenders, I saw Colin was just on here. You know what a pain in the ass it is to fill out mortgage applications with different lenders every single time you buy a house? Like, and I'm not trying to like big dog or anything here, like 10 properties, right? And I've probably worked with four or five different lenders. I would, I would much rather much rather just send all of my stuff to Colin so I don't have to go through pulling the last two months of mortgage statements for 10 properties for the six bank accounts that I have pulling the last three months of those statements, doing all these, even a photocopy of my ID. I'm like, can I just text it to you? Right. Understand this, like understand the consumer habit and what they want and how they want to be sold because they don't want to just go back out and just meet somebody random unless you blew it. And sorry, Colin, if I threw you under the bus there, but um, spending 30 minutes filling out a mortgage app at 7.30 at night is just not like my most ideal activity at nighttime after work. But you guys get the point. Jelena, what do you think about this? I saw you just walked in. You're in the office. You're putting me on the spot. Um, I am. That's okay. okay. I don't mind. Um, so I think that uh, one thing I've learned consistently in my seven years in real estate is that if you are not actively working your pipeline all the time, which has to include the people who are ready now, as well as the people who are six to nine months out or the people who are 12 months or more out, is you're going to go through those big lulls. And the more consistent you are with prospecting um, and prospecting multiple lead sources. Do not put all of your eggs in one basket. Um, you will be able to turn kind of the peaks and valleys in real estate into more rolling hills. And along with that, you're, you're consistent in what's happening in the market, right? So if we go through these big swaths where we're, we have to prospect constantly because we have nothing in our pipe and we haven't been nurturing our, our leads, you know, we're, we're missing out on being out there actively in the market, showing homes and kind of what the experience is. And so I just have found like the more consistent you are with prospecting, the better communication you'll have with your clients about what's really happening out there in the market. And that is what conveys expertise to the people that you're talking to. Something that I always try to do, um, which I, I loved the post you made on the Facebook page is um, something of value. 
to every time that I connect with the client. So I try to text at least one property a week to somebody and uh, to every lead that I have. And I will tell them what it is about that property that I think is a great fit for them, what's happening in the area and why we should go see it. And my goal is to always keep people informed about what's happening in the market, but also enthusiastic about it. So if I don't convey enthusiasm and excitement for why that's the right property for them, why would I expect that that's what they feel about it? So that's my goal every time I talk to people. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. And I totally agree. I think in real estate, we sometimes make it more difficult than it has to be. But it's also relatable to everything else in life. Like in in terms of prospecting in that roller coaster ride, Jelena, like if we drink beers every single night and eat like shit, we'd gain weight, right? How much harder is it to lose weight than it is to gain weight? Correct. It's really, it's really hard, right? And um to, to, to go back, like, let's just say we gain 15 pounds to, to lose 15 pounds. We need to cut all of that out. We need to be on track every single day. We have to have that consistency back again. And then guess what? You're going to have a consistent weight. It, think, it goes the same way with a lot of different things, but the relation to real estate is if we don't prospect or we don't work our database at all, then yeah, we are going to have that two, three week session where we're constantly on the phones making calls. What if we did this? What if we made it a habit of working the database once a day between nine and noon. And we made it a goal of talking to simply five people a day, simply five people. And you could go back to those ponds, grab the last four to six months, reach out to them, send them new properties. Maybe, you know, if you're doing open houses like Sarah, um, you're keeping them updated once a week on, on what open houses are around the area. You're simply sending them an email. The more that we're in having those conversations with people, the more consistent that pipeline is going to be. Right. And, yeah. And, and that comes to mind because Jelena and I are up here slamming, uh, you know, protein shakes all day. And, <laughs> and we understand that, like, once you're maintaining it, it's a lot easier than if you have to catch back up. Right. Yes, it is. So. And and the again, you guys in, re in real estate, we go sell three, four homes. Awesome. Like you just sold two million dollars worth of property. OK, let's go on vacation. OK, let's go buy something. OK, let's go do this or that. Well, you're not doing the things consistently that got you to that point, that got you to the three, yep. four home sales. And that's why we have this roller coaster like this, right? Uh, we don't see it as much on the team level because we're diversified over, you know, a lot of different agents, but um, individually, you guys all know what I'm talking about. I mean, I, I'm not going to pull up anybody, but you sell five homes in a month, you sell zero the next. It's only, it's only because of your consistency of the routine. Now, if you if you don't know what to say, or you don't know what to do when you're doing those reach outs, then let's let's have some more trainings. But as I just said, the gold bar or the carrot is your lead in to having that conversation with somebody. And don't don't do something just enough to hate it either. The more that you have conversations, the easier those conversations come along. You start to learn the questions that buyers respond to, the information that really they are um, they're seeking. It makes communicating with all future leads or even just going back and recommunicating with those leads easier too. If you're only doing something enough to hate it or just get by, there's no growth in that. Definitely. Definitely. All right, you guys, what, what comes to mind? You struggling with anything? You have an objection you want to talk about? Strategy, any questions from this? We've got 10 minutes. Parker, what would be your uh, response or, or conversion way if you talk to somebody like I got a call from Zillow the other day about land and he like stressed over the phone, hey, I'm only interested in this exact property, nothing else. Because I tried to be like, hey, what, you know, why, why are you looking here to try and get him on a couple other? And he's like, no, this is this is it. First thing that comes to mind, it's, I try to disarm him. It's always what I try to do. Let's say like, Josh, what is it about this property that really intrigues you? Like, do you know about some like hidden treasure that's buried in the middle of that lot or what? <laughs> Did you get I was say, Wait, I maybe would, I misunderstood? I say... Maybe I misunderstood, Josh. Did you and your wife get married in the middle of that lot at one point? Like, t tell me what's so special. I'd love to know what's so special about this lot. I usually always try to say to them, 
okay, I understand and I hear you, you know, you want to be in this area. Tell me a little bit more about that. What draws you to this area? And then if they say, well, there's a lot of trees, that is usually where I'll crack a joke, like what there are trees in Rosemount too, you know, and and doing it that way to take that edge off, they, they're shutting you down that way. And if they really shut down, then I will end the conversation, you know, nicely, obviously. But then the next day, I will try to send them the exact kind of similar piece of land in another area. And suddenly they're like, oh, yeah, okay. And then I tell them the only way to really know is to see it. Let's go see it and have some coffee. And then usually they kind of ease up a little bit. And they almost always go to the other area. Josh, did you try asking why? I did. Um, kind of wasn't that responsive to it. Um, he said, you know, I've been, I've bought a lot before. I know where I like, and that's the spot. We need to re we need to replace the word why with I'm curious. I'm curious to know. It it's like it, just human behavior, like why is a intimidating term. Like if you came in and you're like, hey, I'm slow, right? My business is slow. And I said, Josh, why is your business slow? Why aren't you making any money? Why are you having issues? Versus like, I'm really curious, what do you think led to this? Or what do you think we could do to get back on track? self-discovery right but um obviously the concept you guys i'm not picking on on jelena but the concept of why digging deeper finding out what is the purpose of that conversation is important but let's let's use terms like i'm curious and on the flip side when somebody does something that you don't disagree or that you don't agree with tell them you know josh i'm concerned because not no you're, you're making a bad choice josh no i'm i'm honestly i'm really concerned about, about this decision can i tell you why or how about using this as an opportunity for our off market? This is the only property you're interested in because it's the only one you can have access to on Zim Zillow or any other public website. What if I told you I have access to properties that aren't on the market? And if I know a little bit more about why you like this property, I could find similars within my network that other people don't even have access to right now. Or another way. Um, Sounds like, like a I carrot to me. I had a Cannon Falls person that really, really, truly just did want to be on Lake Billsby. That was it. That was the dream. Um, and so one thing I would do maybe, Josh, in that is see, call the listing agent and see if, if it's okay if you walk the land, right? And see if you can't get that buyer to walk that land. Because how many times do we see financing fall through or whatever it is? And so that you can maybe get there in front of them to find out what, you know, Obviously, unless it's like just, you know, a 20 by 20 foot piece of land, but you know what I mean. If there's actually an ability to walk through, chat, find out what you like, he likes about that land and then say, you know, let me get to work and see if I can find that off market. Sometimes just getting in front that way, you know, and what if financing falls through for the other person, you're going to be the first one they call because you have that connection with the listing agent. Hopefully. There are roundabout ways to get the answers too. I mean, you can ask an entirely different type of question by disarming them. Um, oh, you're really interested in this property. How long have you been keeping an eye on it? That'll tell you if they've been watching that area for a while. Sounds like you've been planning your dream home. What's that look like? Different things to maybe get their mindset off of what they're fixed on and get them to give you some details that open up an opportunity for conversation. Yep. Uh, build on that. Tell me more, right? Tell me more, Josh. Tell me more about this piece of property. Well, what do you mean? Well, tell, tell me more about why it's so special to you. But, you know, so good, good suggestion there, Liz. Colin, rule number one of good interviewed, colorless questions lead to colorful answers. Interviewer. Sorry about that. Oh, is, did that come from WCCO, by the way? Uh, uh, very funny. Very funny. Yeah. I do find that, um, the best salespersons that I know are the best listeners. I mean, it's so easy to get tied up, especially if you're a newer agent, you're maybe in an uncomfortable situation. You're thinking, 
God, I really have to be prepared. What if they say this? What if they say this? And you get stuck in that psychological fear loop. And the reality is, don't go there. You know, the client is simply wanting to be heard. So if you can provide that for them, you're ahead of four out of five salespersons in the real estate industry already. Great point. Become comfortable with long, awkward pauses as well. That's something I learned. If you ask a question, you have to give them time to respond and maybe they need time to kind of formulate that thought. But in the absence of something said, as hard as it may be as a sale person, or if you like to talk like me, just shut up and <laughs> let the lead tell you what it is they need or want. Get comfortable with those awkward pauses after you ask a question and wait for them to fill in the gap. It's called, it's actually called like silent probing. Like when I did like survey way, way back in high school, I had like a phone job calling surveys and they would tell us like, ask the question and stay silent. And then they would eventually say something. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's really And funny. I highly recommend if you're also like me that like talk, practicing that um, because I did do that over like the last two years, I've been really working on that. And I feel like my relationships with clients has just gotten so, they were good before. I feel like they're even better and deeper now and way more meaningful. And those are the clients that I'm finding are saying, I'm staying connected with. They're inviting me to baby showers and weddings. And it, whereas the ones in the beginning that I didn't, I really haven't heard a whole lot from them. So it's so just I taken different. Yeah, I completely agree with all of that because no, yeah, not kind of, sorry, I lost my train of thought, but oh, that was it. So like for me, I talk a ton and like, you know, it wasn't necessarily easy for me to say like to start listening and really start like hearing about what they're saying. But after you start like waiting and pausing and then like asking those questions, you start like to care more about them too, because you're hearing more about their situation you're like oh wait like that is kind of relevant to what they're looking for oh and like for me it just brings a level of like genuinity to like the, the entire transaction overall alexa one of the things i'd really think about and jen you too you guys both do talk a lot it's not a bad thing it's a good thing it's why you're so friendly it's why you're so likable but it's personality matching you know mm -hmm. Figure out the person that you're talking to, figure out their personality type, and then you need to change your personality, the way you communicate with them to match them. Because I've learned this just so many, so many different times. Like if I meet a driver, um, they just want the detail. They just want, just give it to them straight, right? Let them make a decision, yeah. give it to them straight. If you find an intellectual, like I went on, uh, I met with a past client two weeks ago. I thought it was in the bag, right? They're both engineers, which are pretty, uh, analytical people for the most part i'm like i walk out of the house i shake their hand they write back they're like yeah we disagree with the price we're gonna go somebody else I'm like whoa okay like, i didn't even bring any stats in there that's totally my fault right uh i don't know if they're gonna sell or not if if it's a uh, i personality like you guys jen alexa like they're gonna love to chit chat all around the house right they're gonna love to talk and you guys are probably gonna form rapport super fast but part of that sales EQ, again, is understanding who you're talking to and understanding how you need to change your approach to match theirs. I call that the Jesus method. Become all things to all people. Oh, love that one, Juliana. That one was good. <laughs> that was a good little quote right there. And that's on my fridge for tomorrow. Hey, Parker, it's Sharon Blossom. I've got something to add to what you're saying about understanding people's personality and how they want to be sold to. Um, I fully agree that... Like for me, my, my personality style is a, a nurturing personality style. So chatting and making connection on a personal level, I love that. But if I'm the seller and you come to my house and that's the way we've interacted so far and you're not prepared for the appointment and you don't know the information that I'm expecting you to know, my personality ch style changes and I'll go right into taking action instead of being nurturing and it will throw somebody off. But if you don't have what you commit to having, you're not gonna get the nurture side of me. You're gonna get the very direct side of me. So I think that's something to be aware of too. Um, I know I, know, I wanna just say- That's okay too. 
What's that? Yeah, that's that's okay. It happens to all of us in many different situations. Like you put me in a room full of a bunch of people and I just want to leave as quickly as possible. Like I hate it. I hate big groups. Airport, I literally hate the airport so much. Uh, even like, to be honest with you guys, like we have a team party and there's 150 people in the room. Like that makes me uncomfortable. So I have to remind myself to not be like that, not have those uncomfortable feelings and instead embrace the different personalities in the room and the people that I can connect with and talk with. I guess what I funny? Know, why do we do that? Cause I do the same. Like I went to this yep. big party for somebody that I was so excited about. I panic. And I'm because you guys, I'm, here's, I'm here's really my, working on that. Here's why it happens in my experience. When you, when an individual is under stress, whether it's good stress or bad stress, that's when their personality style shifts a little bit. Yeah. So in my like, case, if I nurture and I'm having a good rapport with an agent and they're coming to talk to me about selling my house and now all of a sudden the rubber's hitting the road and I'm a little bit panicked, now is when I want all the facts. We right. can hug at the end, but I want you to give me all the facts. And if you don't have all the facts, I'm not going to feel comfortable. But I wanted to add something to Parker to the general conversation. And it goes back to, I have both a short-term and a long-term example of this. <clears throat> and it was a video that Liz and Steve did. And Parker, you posted on your Facebook, which I thought was fabulous. It's the one more call idea or reality. So I have a, a Zillow lead that I went out with early fall and showed them like three houses, I think. And at the, at the end of the third one, the conversation was like, okay, well, we're going to be away until January, mid-January. So we'll be in touch basically. And I thought, oh, okay. You know, I'm never going to hear from these people again. So I stayed in touch with them. I sent them something every now and then that I thought was interesting or might be fun for them to hear. Well, sure enough, they went out of the country and sure enough, mid-January, they started returning and texting back to me and we're looking at houses again in the next week or two. So that was just like staying on it and, and continuing. And I'll tell you what my challenge is in a second. And then the other one was just recently, earlier this week, I went on an appointment with a buyer to a new build and the rep from the building company was there and they, he said the meeting was going to be an hour. So I thought, okay, great. And then I've got a, a, a showing at the top of the hour that I can move on to. Well, about an hour before the showing, I got a call from the listing, a message from the listing agents that they canceled the showing because the house was sold. And this was a Zillow lead that I hadn't yet had more than the initial Zillow call with because it came like a day or two prior. And again, my mind went to, oh, shoot, now, like, I don't have enough of a rapport with this person. I'm going to have to call them and let them know only an hour before that it's canceling. And I don't have time to talk with them about it because I'm in this other meeting. But I sent her a message. I called her. She didn't answer. I sent her a text and explained what happened. She, and I said, I call, I'll call later this evening. Well, I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna do it one more time. I'm gonna go ahead and try to call her, even though I think maybe she's gonna blow me off. But I called her, I ended up having a fabulous conversation with her. I went right into a more extended buyer script with her. Through that, I learned that they're downsizing. They're looking for a house in the mid 400s here in Minnesota. Um, they need to sell the house that they're in. And they're looking for a home, a winter home out in Nevada. And I happen to know the number three real estate agent in Las Vegas. So. We've got potentially three hits from that one more, just give it one more try. It, this, it works with, I don't want to just like label internet leads and, and cold leads into this either. It works with your sphere too. Like you go on a, you go on a, a listing appointment and, and they'll be like, you know what, Jelena, I'm not, we're not going to actually be ready until so-and-so gets out of school and graduates yep. eight months from now. Right. Two years that, from now, sometimes. two years from now, that doesn't mean that we just do jack nothing until then. Right. right. We put them into our systems. We put them onto our uplay into our CRM. We we think about them every couple of weeks. What potentially could I provide them? What gold bar or carrot can we give them? And and um, I saw this works for everybody and everybody in real estate. It's just basic sales. There's there's three things that I'll finish with. And then I got to bounce is. Fantastic book. It's called Atomic Habits. Love that Atomic book. Habits. Yep. Um, listen to it or read it. Um, there is one line in there that really makes so much sense to me. And it, it works for personal, it works for business, it works for everything we're talking about. And it's, you do not rise to the level of your goals. You, you fall to the level of your systems. You fall to the level of your systems. And what does that mean? A personal system is your routine. It's your habits. It's how you structure your day. And one more call, by the way, was a system that we had. Steve and I were, we'd go to the office every day between 8.30 and 9. 
we would prospect and work our database until noon. We'd go on appointments until four o'clock. And then that one more call would always happen be between four and five o'clock. And it works because that was our system. So I, I challenge you, what is your personal system? Because okay, hang when you're- Hang on, this is very important. See this? Oh, look, it's right there. Are you so impressed? Love it, Liz. I Thank would like you, to point out that, I'm impressed. Impressed. that you made if fun you of me when I taped that up there, but whatever, keep going. <laughs> I'll add that like, if you don't have the time, you know, let's say you're getting home late, like you have to figure out, like I'm a prime example where I've gone up and down and up and down. Um, so I've added that, you know, I was making an excuse that I didn't have the time to make that one more call because I tend to work a little bit later. So I've added that in where that's like my last step at night, where I find that one more, you know, one more house to send somebody, whether it's a text or an email. And, and that has begun to make a difference. And now I just have to stay on top of it and stop making the excuses. So Jen, you just do one a day and you literally like, every I day yeah, like I'll send one out or, or send a video or, you know, send something. And then usually that's when I'll also do like one more social media post or something, you know, something quick. And, and I was feeling for a long time, like people weren't seeing them. But now when I'm going to things, people are saying, holy cow, like I'm seeing your videos and doing it. So then like, I'll follow that up the next day or, you know, two days later with a, hey, thank you for mentioning that and all of a sudden like it's really starting to feel like it's starting to grow you know it's starting to happen where people are seeing that I am here you know and a little bit more present I just so, have one last question how late is too late to connect with someone at night it depends because you you know and ask it and and just flat out ask them like hey are you a night person or a morning person right so I know who my night owls are and I have some of my best conversations at 1030 at night huh. because I know that they're night people, you know, so you really have to find out some of my best night people were older people. They tend to sleep in a little bit more and they stay up. So I just flat out ask them now, like, you know, is it too late to text you at this time? Or would you prefer an email? And in asking those deeper questions and then shutting up and actually listening, I'm finding out a little bit better who they are instead of just assuming who they are, because I don't, in my generation, it was assumption is the mother of all F-ups, right? So I was assuming too much in the beginning. Um, sorry, lost dog. I got to go. Let me, <laughs> hey, let, me say, let me say this, Alexa, we're, we should not be prospecting at 1030 at night. If somebody wants a follow-up call and you want to take that call at 1030, like Jen is saying, take that call. Your follow-up should be done between four and 630. Okay. Okay. So, so just to close that the system that I'm talking about, what is your personal system, right? Tanner can tell you about what his system is. He's been, he's done two 75 hards in a row. He has a personal system that leads him to his production goals. What is that? What I said earlier, five conversations. What is the system that's going to lead you to having five conversations a day? Is that prioritizing your time between nine and 11 AM to have those conversations? I don't care if it's a million dollar lead that wants to see a house. Are you going to break your commitment and your system to go show that house? Or are you going to keep doing the things that are going to lead you to success and the desired outcomes? Right. And just um, a quick, just a quick piggyback off that to then too, if you're reaching out to people at, to, I'm not a night person. <laughs> so if then if you're reaching out to people at 1030 at night, that then opens the door for them to constantly come to you at that time. So like I personally, for my business have a very like strict boundary where anything after eight, unless I'm working actively on an offer, I'm not taking it. So I think you also just kind of have to figure out where within your business, what are your boundaries? So then Ash, what best time do you do that, wake Ashley. up at? One second, the best, sorry, the best sorry, way sorry. to forecast that so you'll never have an issue ever is to forecast that expectation up front. Here, here's what I'm going to deliver to you as my client. I work between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. I, I take an hour at the end of the day to spend with my family, and then I go to bed. If you need anything in between those hours, I'm going to be as responsive as anybody, right? Where you get into the habit of getting those people to continue to call you is when you answer that phone, like you said, Ashley, and then they say, oh, well, I called Ashley on Thursday night at 10 o'clock. 
let me try her again on Monday night and Tuesday night and Thursday night. It's a lot yeah. harder to stop it in, mm -hmm. in the progress than it is to set the expectation. It just took that. one client to constantly bombard me my first yeah. like six months. And I was like, I'm so overwhelmed. And so from that point on. Yeah, I should add that I have also started to do that, right? So it's not every night at 1030, you know, so I have told them after eight, you know, unless we're writing an offer, right, that if it's not urgent, it will come in. But sometimes some of my best ones, you know, you just really have to fill it out for each one because you may have somebody that works second shift, right? So are you going to lose them just because of that? No. So it's not for everybody that I do that. It's just particular people. If I can. I know, Jen. Again, remember, it's personal preference. So if you like that and you want to offer that, do it. Absolutely. But you're going to have to have a period of time as well for Jen to, to set that boundary as well, whether that's in, in the morning, at lunch, whatever it is. We all, my whole point, my whole point is set your system up so that you can succeed so that if you get off track, you still have that system in place. So you're still making those five conversations every single day or those 10 or those 20 or whatever it is that you set in place.